Welcome to the RSET training, Transforming Earth Observation Data into Building Infrastructure Data Sets for Disaster Risk Modeling. My name is Brock Blevins, and I'm an RSET trainer based at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to the first part of this three-part webinar series. Before we begin, I will briefly inform you about the RSET program. For those unfamiliar to the Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, or RSET, RSET is part of NASA's Applied Sciences Capacity Building Program. RSET provides accessible, relevant, and cost-free trainings on remote sensing satellites, sensors, methods, tools, and applications, all tailored to audiences with a variety of experience levels. Our trainings cover a range of data sets and analysis tools and their applications to agriculture, climate and resilience, disasters, ecological conservation, health and air quality, and water resources. Trainings are offered online or in person, freely available to anyone with an internet connection and conducted either live or instructor-led or asynchronous and self-paced. Our set trainings have both bilingual and multilingual options and use only open source software and data. Since 2009, the program has reached over 100,000 participants from over 180 countries. We encourage you to visit our website and learn more about the program. All RSET materials are freely available to use and adapt to your curriculum. If you use the methods and data presented in these RSET trainings, please acknowledge the NASA Applied Remote Sensing Training Program. The following slides will provide you with an overview of this three-part webinar series. So why is climate risk assessment important? Even with the drastic reduction in carbon emissions, short and medium term impacts are inevitable. Climate change impacts and risks are increasingly becoming complex and more difficult to manage. Climate change impacts on human infrastructure are not well understood and vary drastically by location. So understanding community-specific risks to climate change is critical to evaluating adaptation strategies. By following the approaches described in this three-part training, participants should be able to recognize what building vulnerability is and why it's important to risk modeling, identify the core elements of natural hazard risk modeling and asset loss estimation, identify fundamental approaches for developing building exposure models using earth observation data and tools, apply a basic procedure to model built infrastructure exposure and vulnerability, characteristics from earth observation data, evaluate building specific exposure data to identify key components for fit, validity, consistency, and rectify bias, evaluate the appropriate use of model building exposure data to a given community, apply strategies to identify and address equity and bias considerations, apply approaches to validate the building data with imagery from regional data sets, and document your exposure development process through metadata so that others can understand the process used, the limitations, and how to update it if necessary. The prerequisites for this three-part training are fundamentals of remote sensing, which we have available uh, on demand, and you can familiar through the RSET program um, for those who are unfamiliar with some of the basics of remote sensing, or if you have equivalent experience, that's fine, but also a basic understanding of risk, disaster risk management. So a quick review of prior knowledge. So, uh, just to know that climate change science tells us about the regional climate. Hazard specialists tell us about the hazards. GIS and Earth observations give us an idea of where that exposure is. And engineers tell us about the susceptibility to damage or vulnerability. And together, these can give us risk or likelihood of an impact. And for this, GIS is critical. GIS provides a digital glue between the disciplines um, by evaluating new sensors, technology, and data sets, understanding and communicating key GIS concepts and limitations, and then fusing, harmonizing, and assessing quality of multimodal based data. 
Over the next week, there'll be three two-hour parts that will include presentations and question and answer sessions. All materials and recordings from each session will be available on the training webpage, usually within 24 hours of the live session. So you can go back and review before the next one. Additionally, there'll be one homework assignment that will be posted on October 10th, the last day of this training series, and that will have a due date of October 24th. This will be in the form of a Google form. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live parts and complete the homework assignment before the given due date. Which brings us to part one, where we will cover the development of regional exposure data with Earth observation. So the objectives for part one is that by the end, we hope that participants will be able to recognize what building vulnerability is and why it is important to risk modeling, be able to identify the core elements of natural hazard risk modeling and asset loss estimation, and also identify the fundamental approaches for developing building exposure models using EO data and tools. Please put your questions in the question box and we'll address those at the end of the webinar. Feel free to enter your questions as we go, and we'll try to address all questions during the Q&A session. Any remainder of questions will be answered in the Q&A document, which we will post to the training webpage about a week after that part. It is now my pleasure to introduce the guest trainers for today's webinar, Charles Hike, Executive President of ImageCat, Georgiana Esquivius, Geospatial Analyst for ImageCat, and Mike Uchi, project engineer, also with ImageCat. We are delighted to have them joining us as guest trainers to discuss the development of regional exposure data with Earth observations. Charlie, over to you. Thank you. All right, thanks for coming today. Uh, we're gonna start with an explanation of what exposure data is and how it's used in the loss estimation process. So first of all, when people think about exposure data, they generally think about uh, these type of architectural renderings or uh, uh, things that you see in movies, uh, video games uh, that imply quite a bit of detail about what might be going on on the inside of a building, but are actually uh, essentially just um, um, drawings, CAD drawings and that type of thing. Um, uh, I've never seen these uh, be able to be repurposed or used for um, the type of things that we're talking about. It's uh, generally a whole different level of data. What we're talking about is the general um, um, building exposure data that's typically on an aggregated basis or a building specific basis that will give you things like um, um, a structural type, the vulnerability, the replacement cost, or the type of rough characteristics that you need for risk analysis. So it's something quite quite different. So what we're talking about is exposure data used for disaster risk reduction. We call it loss estimation, risk modeling. Sometimes you hear uh, cap modeling used. Um, these are things that are used to essentially help nations try to reach their sustainable development goals. Um, and um, there are kind of four main categories that you can think of, uh, of that you might use these data. Um, uh, before an event happens, for planning scenarios, what happens if a category five hits Miami or New York? What happens if a magnitude eight earthquake happens on a, on, in um, uh, Los Angeles or there's a 500 year flood in the Midwest? Um, these, um, scenarios are used, um, you know, they actually sort of play them out, bring together teams of folks from um, state, local, federal, tribal um, governments to pretend like they're responding to an event um, to figure out where there's gaps uh, and what, th what they might do better to respond in the future. During events, something is actually happening. Um, what is it going on? What should we do about it? Should we evacuate an area? Um, should people be boarding up their windows? Uh, is this hurricane going to hit Maine or Boston? Uh, this kind of thing. And if it does, if it goes this way or that, what are the possible ramification, ramifications um, after an event? So an earthquake has just happened. For example, uh, is international help required? Uh, where is there's the most damage? Uh, where should we be deploying resources and search and rescue? And then on average, so um, uh, you've run a single scenario. 
It gives you kind of that, that, that single event view, but if you run suites of thousands of scenarios, you can kind of see what might happen at the annualized level, the 100 year level, the 500 year level, and you can use those to make um, um, decisions uh, about things like uh, retrofitting or insurance premiums. So what we're talking about is the field of disaster risk reduction uh, represented here on the left, which has been going on for at least 100 years. Uh, on the right, we've got a new field uh, called uh, climate change adaptation, and there's intersections between um, the two of them. Um, and that's getting, um, they're more and more enmeshed as we understand, begin to understand tactically on the ground what the probable effects of climate change can be and uh, how we should go about uh, um, um, responding to the uh, to those climate changes. But unfortunately, these we've uh, got two different disciplines with two different lexicons and um, we use words that are similar in very different ways. So in disaster risk reduction and disaster risk management, the concept is to reduce the impacts of disasters um, um, through preventative measures that we people do. Uh, climate change adaptation is uh, we talk about adaptation, which is uh, making human human driven adjustments, um, um, to the ecosystem, the policy or processes to respond to. Uh, uh, changes of, uh, in climate. So we've got different kind of stated goals there. Uh, in disasters, we talk about mitigation in terms of lessening the probable impact to a community, uh, a society, a system, a, a building um, by changing the attributes of that building or, you know, uh, it can be social policies or public awareness, but in general, um, um, changing uh, something that has an impact on, um, uh, on essentially the vulnerability. And mitigation and climate change policy, mitigation is defined quite differently uh, and is used for the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions that are the source of climate change. We don't use mitigation in that same uh, context. So there's some confusion there sometimes. And likewise, vulnerability. Um, vulnerability refers to um, the physical conditions of a building or uh, or uh, uh, Social, socially vulnerable class of uh, people uh, that essentially says, you know, you've got an excitation, what will probably happen in terms of damage or impact? Uh, it's kind of the inherent properties of those, uh, of that system, whether they're exposed to the hazard or not. Whereas the vulnerability uh, in climate change adaptation really refers to uh, um, things that are uh, 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 in a hazardous area. So, um, you know, whether or not you're, um, uh, that which is what, sort of what we would call the risk, right? It's not the inherent properties of the system, but it's because you've got exposure in a, um, um, a hazardous area. So we're, we're talking about a very specific uh, uh, ontology here, if you will, where we've got three kind of pillars, the hazard, the exposure, and the vulnerability. Um, and I'm going to go through them one by one, but it's possible, for example, to have exposure and vulnerability but no risk because there's no hazard there. For example, um, my house would fall down if it was hit by a 20 foot wave, but it's just not gonna happen because there's not the hazard there, so there's not the risk. So hazard tells us things uh, such as where uh, uh, things are, are likely to happen, how strong it is, the intensity of the wind speed, the depth of the flooding, the, the, the ground motion, uh, uh, how often, uh, when with a forecast, what the duration is going to be, how long it will be exposed to a given wind speed or a given depth of flooding. And you're all familiar probably with these type of hurricane maps or 100 year flood maps. All of these impact just the uh, effect of the nature on the ground, for, um, so to speak. And there's lots of different parameters that they, of ways that they can be expressed, but that's all kind of the hazard area, the natural phenomenon, if you will. Now, when we talk about uh, uh, vulnerability, particularly when we talk about building vulnerability, how likely is that building to fall down or be damaged given a level of hazard? So if the wind is so strong, how likely uh, will it be that the, um, the envelope will be compromised and the wind will go into the house and lift the roof up and uh, fall over? Or uh, given uh, the flood waters are five foot deep, what's the percent damage likely to be to your home? These are kind of expressions of vulnerability that are independent of the occurrence of the hazard. 
And then we put this all into a risk paradigm. So we've got the exposure, which we'll be talking about um, uh, quite a bit, that's on top of this, um, of this slide that goes in with uh, mapped to vulnerability. These vulnerabilities are things that, uh, you know, they can, they develop through testing or empirical um, classes, uh, these uh, very, very specific uh, uh, functions, damage functions or vulnerability functions. Cross-reference that with the hazard, you do your calculation and that gives you some sort of loss or probability of loss that uh, enables decision support. And there's two kind of main pillars of the risk analysis that we talk about. We talk about deterministic or scenarios, which is um, uh, sort of a single event, uh, one sort of time slice, or it could be multiple time slices for a hurricane if it's approaching, that kind of thing. But it's essentially running a one framework. This is one loss scenario. Um, and, but there's a prob probabilistic analysis that we uh, um, refer to in this context, typically the probabilistic is referring to having a whole suite of events to figure out what the uh, loss might be over time. So here we've got a curve, an EP curve they call these. So given a return interval, um, that would be, you can see here a 10 year event, a 50 year event, a 100 year event. Um, so that's sort of piece of the deterministic puzzle that slices into that probabilistic, how much loss you would expect to, to have experienced to a system or a building given the vulnerability. So this is um, what's used to make probabilistic um, decisions. So all of this kind of feeds into um, uh, uh, the disaster risk reduction framework um, that tries to help uh, uh, nations meet their sustainable development goals. Uh, there's a more kind of uh, disaster specific a framework, the Sendai framework, where they have specific metrics that come more directly out of the uh, risk assessment, but you can map those to the sustainable development goals, and countries are trying to do that in order to uh, um, reduce their losses, particularly um, uh, in the face of climate change. So although the climate science is different than the disaster science, more and more we're understanding um, what those impacts are and what we're doing is we call it climate conditioning the models so that we can understand uh, how that's changing on the ground. So back to exposure development. What is building exposure in the context of, of disaster uh, risk reduction? So here we've got four different pictures depicting four different, very different ways that people live. Very high rise uh, uh, residential construction, uh, informal, uh, um, what we would call informal construction or unengineered construction, although uh, very impressive uh, hut here on the upper right. Uh, um, uh, very typical apartment building blocks, in this case, on a very high hazard area and that it's uh, um, set on a hillside. And then very typical um, single family residential uh, uh, probably American construction, uh, modern engineered structures. So um, a lot of what uh, happens is uh, what we're trying to do is characterize for a given area, a given census tract, a, a given cell, what the number of buildings are, uh, where is it that's depicted by the cell itself, by structure type, by costs, um, uh, for the purpose of assessing that. In this context, uh, what we find ourselves doing uh, much of the time is saying, uh, given a number of people, a population uh, grid, for example, how many households are there? And given those house households, what's the dwelling area? And um, uh, how does that change through time and through space? So it's often um, a, a more of an art than a science. Uh, a, a very large data fusion exercise where you take as much as possible um, uh, the data that, that's in and make the best decision for distributing that out, minimizing bias in the process. So that's what we'll be talking about uh, in detail over the next several days. So in that context, there's um, uh, certain questions that we can answer, and then there's things that, that we really can't answer. We've uh, gone through kind of generally what we want to do, but you know, we can say yes, uh, with this type of process, uh, we can assess whether it's cost effective to retrofit certain building types regionally. Uh, where should we focus our retrofitting efforts? Where should we get started? Where are the riskiest areas? Are building codes cost effective? Uh, and where are they cost effective? What might happen given a different uh, specific event? What just happened for a specific event? But it does not tell us is it cost effective to retrofit this specific building or which buildings fell down after an event, which homes are flooded, 
uh, exactly how many buildings uh, uh, fell down. Um, uh, and it's important to emphasize this because it's very easy for people to uh, have false precision that comes out of these models. And it's important to um, um, uh, keep uh, reassessing what the, what, what's a valid uh, um, decision here uh, and what's not an appropriate decision for this process. So here's some examples, some uh, products that we've been uh, we've produced in the past and projects that we've been involved with. Uh, one is um, the estimate of fatalities after the Nepal earthquake. Here our client was UNICEF and they were looking to reach out to uh, orphan children um, um, for the purposes of life safety and, uh, and finding shelter for these folks. And we were able to produce this a very wide uh, area uh, estimate of what the fatalities would be. Um, um, with an idea that, that that would correspond to where uh, orphan children were. Uh, a high profile example in the United States, a, uh, a uh, effort funded by Congress and managed by FEMA. Uh, we did the work with a National Institute of Building Sciences and a, a team of experts, which basically established how cost of effective it is to uh, mitigate for, for given hazards um, um, both to code and then above code. Uh, and this is a very high profile project that's been, uh, you know, uh, uh, referenced by uh, President Biden, um, used in um, hundreds of, uh, of subsequent studies, uh, media and so forth. And it helps kind of promote awareness of uh, the cost effectiveness of mitigation. And all of that was done uh, with a background of exposure data. Another example are cat bonds in developing countries. Uh, Mexico uh, um, had a cat bond for earthquake, uh, which they, they hit the jackpot twice with 8.0 uh, magnitude earthquakes, triggering um, a release of hundreds of millions of dollars that allowed them to get back on their feet, distribute that uh, to their um, uh, people in their countries. And, you know, the faster that money gets out there, um, the quicker that um, uh, they're able to rectify the problems and get the economy going and avoid cascading effects. Um, a very well-known phenomenon in, um, in disaster science. Um, and if they you know, hadn't done that, then they would have to figure out where that money was going to come from. They would have to um, uh, presumably argue about it uh, from a policy uh, standpoint, uh, maybe take the money from somewhere else or uh, ask the international community. So they didn't have to do any of that stuff. So all of that gets um, deployed right away and that helps folks get back on their feet. And this is seen as a, um, a probable template for uh, developing countries that don't have an insurance infrastructure to help, um, uh, particularly where you've got the exacerbated effects of climate change, um, um, the drought and, uh, and, and flooding. And Africa is, is an example of uh, good candidates for, for cat bonds. So um, we'll just touch on uh, um, the uh, the limitations here, we've got a whole presentation uh, here, but it's um, what comes out of these exposure databases, typically not accurate at the cell level, um, particularly if you've um, uh, basically inferred this from uh, population data. It cannot be more accurate than the original base data sets that go into it. If you've got uh, problems in that base data um, with um, um, ethnic minorities, for example, that might not be um, considered in the or undercounted in the population data, that's going to be reflected in your exposure data. It can be a big problem. Um, uh, and it cannot be, uh, it cannot expect that it'll always capture small unmapped uh, rural areas. And this is um, a consistent problem in um, mountainous regions or um, in areas that remote sensing isn't good at capturing. Uh, for example, areas with no uh, low night lights um, sometimes are, are difficult to capture. There's a lot of cloud cover or tree canopies. All of these uh, make it very difficult to find uh, uh, rural communities that might be impacted by, by large disasters. And lastly, uh, this, these data sets, it's not good to repurpose them for civic purposes, such as a tax assessor database. Um, you know, these are built for purposes for loss estimation and do not provide the kind of building level accounting that um, you typically need for, um, for government purposes. A lot of challenges in putting these data sets together. Uh, one is data availability, trying to uh, get access to data, permission to use the data once you've found that it's available. There's processing challenges, which we'll be going through, but um, you know, uh, um, having the skill set to do that uh, at, the, at the city level, there's not a lot of cities that have that um, uh, bias that, that are in the um, um, various parts of the data sets, which, which we'll uh, be talking about in, uh, in detail. Human error, 
processing the state, it's very easy to make mistakes and difficult to catch them um, until you've got the risk estimate, estimate and people say, hey, what's this? Do you really think this? And um, that can be a big problem. Uh, data gaps, you're not always going to have all of the data that you would like to um, be able to put these things together. You have to make assumptions and extrapolate um, um, through those, uh, those data gaps. There's misperceptions about what the data sets are. There's um, misperceptions about the accuracy, um, and they're used um, at the building level, which is a false precision problem. Um, explaining the data with clarity is always a challenge to folks um, uh, who are, might uh, be high level and have uh, uh, short attention spans. Thanks. Inappropriate legacies, you develop the data and you give it to folks and they uh, use it for something five years later. Uh, they didn't hear the initial conversations, perhaps, because the original people that um, the data was developed for got new jobs or the people that produced the data got new jobs. Uh, and then just the data getting old and dusty. All of these are, are very big problems, which we'll be touching on uh, as we go through, but things that you have to be co cognizant of. A lot of these aren't um, different than the regular project work that all of you have probably been involved in, but things that need to be uh, tracked and, uh, and recognized uh, nonetheless. The lastly, a challenge is uh, advanced technologies. You've got uh, artificial intelligence, which is exciting on one level and scary on another. Being able to apply it towards uh, building level decisions, for example, it's probably not appropriate. Uh, UAV data, additional sensors. Um, there's a, sort of, I think, a, a thrust in the GIS community to get higher and higher resolution on data, but higher higher resolution data does not mean more accuracy. And it might mean spending more money developing building exposure databases in GIS than is warranted for the risk assessment that's being uh, developed given the uh, um, massive amount of uncertainty that's generally in the hazard data and the vulnerability anyway. So those are all kind of things that you have to think about um, for having a balance here and things that we'll be talking about over the next three days. Hello everyone, I'm Georgiana Esquivias, the Geospatial Analyst for ImageCat, and today I will be discussing the basic process for developing building exposure databases. I will go over these three basic concepts for developing a building exposure database. First, I will discuss what are the different types of building exposure levels. Then I will explain what data is required for developing the exposure database. And throughout the presentation, I will be giving examples of how Earth observation data or satellite data products are used. For the past decade, we have developed a taxonomy and classification system for five exposure level types. These levels are defined by the spatial scale of the input data and communicates the level of detail, content, and method required for producing each exposure level. Level one is a rapid, large-scale building exposure analysis, which primarily sources Earth observation data, uh, trusted global resources, and aggregated demographic and housing data. Level two consists of national level structural distribution information, economic parameters, general and essential facility building stock, demographic data from National Statistical Institutes or Census. Level three requires a significant effort in order to refine national level data to reflect regional or subnational trends. An example would be incorporating climate or cultural regions to better represent the varying construction patterns in each. Or level three can be used to identify large urban areas where building footprint data is used to adjust building counts and built up area estimates. Level four consists of a building specific data set aggregated either to a uniform grid, a fine scale administrative unit, or another boundary smaller than the subnational level. Although the users compromise the spatial resolution of the available data by aggregating it, this method allows for a more accurate representation of the building exposure by reducing the noise in the data. 
And finally, level five is a building or site specific exposure database. This exposure level requires an adequate amount of building specific attribute data in order to ca characterize risk and vulnerability for each location. In this example of the County of Los Angeles, we can see how the building exposure levels differ based on the input data required per level. In this comparative analysis, we came across some unexpected results, such as those found in level one and level five, where in spite of the vast difference in their spatial resolution, these two had the closest total exposure value to one another and the lowest of all the other levels. And when we detrend the results, we saw that the total exposure values for levels two, three, and four were very consistent to one another. This could be due to the fact that although there were regional adjustments made to level three and four, the primary source for each was the hazards database and vulnerability curves. This is especially important for the modeling community to understand because it highlights the fact that an increase in data resolution does not necessarily mean that there will be an increase in precision or accuracy. This exercise allowed us to identify key parameters that significantly affected the output of the results. Those parameters being persons per household values, living area per household, replacement cost values, and exchange rates. Another important takeaway from these five exposure levels is that the degree of uncertainty within each level greatly depends on the quality of the input data. So the analyst must be meticulous in documenting their data sources, methods, and validation process in order to reduce the introduction of errors into the data, especially for exposure levels three and up. Therefore, it is important to understand the methods and data required for processing these seven steps. For estimating building counts and number of people, having accurate and high quality data is essential. For exposure level one and two, Typically, the population, persons per household, or number of households are used to estimate the number of buildings given an average area per household value. While in level four and five, the building count data is more typically used to estimate the number of people. And for level three, land use data, or development patterns are used to refine and reallocate national level population and housing data to the subnational scale. For estimating the number of buildings and built up area, you can use census or micro census housing data, open source building footprint and height profiles and earth observation based data products we have found that there is a positive correlation between the number of households and built up area. So using a sample of building footprints, heights, and number of households, we can train a model to produce total building counts and area estimates that are supported by the census data. The level of detail of these estimates will vary depending on the exposure level of your study. For example, a level one may simply categorize the building counts and total area by an urban rule designation for the entire country, while level three could report these values at a 500 meter grid cell by development pattern type. And a great place to find various EO-based uh, built-up surfaces and population data is the NASA uh, pop grid viewer. If there isn't any documentation or existing building footprint data for your study region, building counts and built-up area can be extracted from high-resolution satellite imagery or aerial photography.
This can be done through traditional remote sensing techniques such as a supervised or unsupervised image classification analysis or with the newer machine learning, neural network, or automated image segmentation algorithms. The image to the right is an example of a supervised classification analysis where the orange pixels represent the building perimeters. These perimeters can be converted to polygon building footprints. And the image to the left shows how the panchromatic image can be used to determine built up area density and later classify the image by density zones, which could represent single family residential areas or high urban areas. And using the extracted building footprints as a sample set, we can extrapolate and estimate number of buildings and built up area. As with the building footprint extraction, we were able to use earth observation based data products for determining building heights. This is an important attribute to obtain because the total living area value is one of the key parameters that directly influences the total building exposure value. What this means is that if we only use the building footprint data then our building exposure values would be underestimated since the values are based solely on the area and not the built up volume. Building heights can also help determine building distribution estimates. In, the, in these images here, you can see how we use Sentinel SAR data to estimate the building heights based on development pattern signatures found in the mountainous region of Nepal. Without this analysis, the pockets of mid-sized towns with two to three story buildings would have been assigned as a rural single story construction. The method for estimating building distribution by development pattern types uh, typically begins with an engineer identifying local construction types for the study region, either through virtual reconnaissance, through available street view imagery, or through an in-person survey. Once the construction types are determined, homogeneous construction type zones, which we call development patterns, are classified, and we begin to create delineated sample polygons for each type. The spatial scale of these delineated polygons will depend on the level of effort and exposure level required for your specific study. This can span from a simple small scale delineation that only classifies the urban rural zones, or it can range to a very detailed large scale mapping unit as seen in the right hand side image of San Jose, Costa Rica. Prior to the development pattern uh, delineations, the building and population distribution for San Jose would have been evenly distributed throughout the administrative unit. But now the buildings are reallocated to the regions that are more consistent with the on the ground observations. Development pattern segmentation allows us to get a better understanding of where people actually live and we can improve the structural distribution estimates and local mapping schemes. All of which is important for disaster risk modeling and mitigation planning because it identifies the vulnerable communities, vulnerable infrastructure and potential risk to important supply chain facilities. Prior to the use of development pattern segmentation, our understanding of a region was limited to an urban rural designation that can be seen in the bottom right hand image, the red being the urban and green being rural. When analyzing risk, we would be limited to using the default vulnerability curves associated to that urban rural designation.
Additionally, you can see that the urban class was overestimated and industrial development pattern types are buried within the data. Now, in the upper right hand corner, uh, the image shows how the development pattern segmentation is able to classify the different degrees of urbanity and it highlights locations of crucial manufacturing and industrial locations. Once the development patterns have been determined, a structural distribution can be estimated using a combination of virtual reconnaissance, building construction literature, and a well-defined stratified sampling strategy. For a level one exposure, you can use global data sets like the World Housing Encyclopedia, whereas for a level three or four, you'll require an in-field survey to sample the structural types within each development pattern. So how do we conduct a sampling strategy? We start by generating a set of randomized points and randomly select an even amount of survey locations per development pattern. While in the field, the survey team takes samples of the buildings found in and around that location, recording important building attribute information like building height, age, occupancy, and structural type. Then those samples are extrapolated to the similar development pattern throughout this study region. This method improves the structural distribution and mapping scheme of the study. Applications like the inventory data capture tool can be used to collect the field data and take geotagged images. As part of the USAID PREPARE program, I traveled to San Jose, Costa Rica to give a workshop on the IDCT tool. The purpose of the workshop was to teach the professors, engineers, firefighters, and local volunteers um, on how to use the data collection tool and how to conduct a building inventory study for a seismic risk analysis. The wonderful part about this program and project was that the local community was able to take command in creating their own building inventory instead of relying on international groups. This allows them to update their databases as needed and utilizes the depth of knowledge from their local experts. After all the building and population data has been collected and the development pattern and mapping schemes have been created, they are all brought together as input data for the Monte Carlo simulation, which models exposure. This takes several iterations and fine tuning of the parameters. For example, we check against the national demographic and housing data in order to evaluate if the output results are reasonable and do not exceed the known building count or population values. The results are also reviewed to resolve any over or underestimating within an individual development pattern type. For example, in Tanzania, we had to create a new special case urban development pattern type for the western portion of the country because after the first iterations, we noticed a significant overestimation of high-rise buildings due to the sampling done in the urban areas of the towns uh, to the east. After the validation process is complete, replacement cost values can be calculated using the estimated total building area, either for occupancy or building type, using various construction cost handbooks for local expert opinion. You may have to experiment with the different replacement cost values and compare the results, or you may have to use a combination of sources which are more applicable to different building types. For example, construction cost manuals may be an excellent source for a dense urban area with high-rise construction 
but may be less useful for a rural area. Uh, in its place, you may want to review cost estimates from a resettlement action plan reports because they might be better suited for scaling replacement cost values of adobe or earthen homes based on the durability factor of the building material. Adding essential facilities is critical for identifying vulnerable communities, at-risk lifeline services, and estimating the availability of resources or shelters in the case of an emergency. Although many humanitarian aid organizations have put in a significant amount of effort in developing more detailed healthcare and education facility information, many countries continue to have very limited data sets, especially those that contain geocoded information. Therefore, sampling and data fu fusion would be required, which can be time consuming, but would bear fruitful for a disaster risk management assessment. To summarize, Earth observation datasets play an integral role in developing building exposure databases. Urban intensity datasets, which are impervious surfaces or built up area data, have a strong correlation with structural pattern types, which aid in the development of structural distribution and development pattern classification. Global population data sets are very valuable for developing a rapid level one or level two building exposure, but you will need to review the uh, accuracy of the data at your location and make adjustments as needed. Development pattern segmentation wouldn't be possible without satellite image composites of various sources, either from nighttime light data, impervious surfaces, land use, and various population grids. Or the, uh, or the composite um, can source satellite imagery and data products that have gone through textural or spectral analysis. Each composite combination can highlight various attributes. For example, dense urban areas can be seen uh, as the white pixels in the bottom image. The covariance image analysis in the upper image highlights another method for extracting building footprints, specifically extracting large industrial facilities or closely grouped informal housing. The use of Earth observation continues to evolve, and I look forward uh, in seeing what the new technology has to offer. Thank you, uh, and this concludes my presentation. Hi, right, my name is Mike Iguchi. I'm the project engineer here at ImageCat, and today I'll be talking about the uh, structural mapping scheme development and uh, building sampling. In this presentation, we'll go over two of the main things uh, required for exposure development. Uh, first are the development patterns. These are country specific. We'll go over uh, what they are and why they're important. And then the second part would be uh, the map escapes. These are basically the building taxonomies. We'll go through how they're defined and how they're developed. So what are development patterns? Basically, there are country-specific homogenous regions of building types and densities that are created using uh, remote sensing data. So essentially, each development pattern gets a unique distribution of the built-up environment. <clears throat> and the built-up environment will include uh, properties such as the structural characteristics, you know, what type of uh, lateral force resisting system is it? What are the building materials? What are the different height profiles and can be related to number of stories? Uh, what's the distribution of occupancies? And these development patterns are, you know, essentially created throughout the entire region. They, so they don't necessarily need to be uh, contiguous. You can have rural in one part separated by residential and then rural. Um, and it's important to note that development patterns will differ by region. Uh, just because you have, you know, some type of development pattern in the U.S. doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have it in a different part of the globe. So why is there a need for these development patterns? Uh, if you look on the left, it's a satellite photo of uh, L.A. County in Southern California. 
if you look on the top right, it's the land use occupancy, which is uh, basically all residential. So if you were just to look at these and you ask me what's the built up environment, I'd assume most of it's, uh, you know, more two story wood frame residential construction. What that neglects to tell you is that there are other parts, maybe it would be, you know, downtown areas, the industrial areas where that's just not the case. So the purpose of the development pattern is to capture that unique built up environment building distribution. So since we know that LA County isn't all single story, two story wood frame construction, we want to be able to identify those regions that are, you know, much different in regards to the built up environment. So here we have a zoomed in photo of some of these areas that we found in LA County. Uh, bottom left is downtown LA. It's where the mid and high rise reinforced concrete or steel, steel frame structures are. Uh, to the top left, just to the west of downtown LA are the, you know, two, three, four, uh, wood frame apartment structures. Uh, on the top is the, uh, industrial regions. These are large warehouses, single story tilt ups typically. Uh, bottom right is a pretty unique situation with the LA port or Long Beach and LA ports. And on the top right is typical single story, one, two wood framed uh, construction that you'll see in most of the suburbs of Southern California. So why do we want to, you know, identify these unique areas? It's because each Building distribution for each of these is quite different. And if we're looking at any type of uh, hazard modeling or anything like that, we want to know these characteristics. We want to know the structure type. We want to know the height. Uh, possibly we want to know the TIV. So the building uh, development patterns will capture all of this information and you'll be able to identify why it's unique. Uh, what's your vulnerability in, in a given location. So now that we know what uh, development patterns are, I'll go through some of the ones that we typically see uh, throughout the world. Uh, it's important to note that, you know, not every country is going to have all these development patterns. Uh, some might not have, you know, those central business districts or high urban areas, which we'll go through later. But here are some examples that we uh, typically see. So the first one is rural. Uh, most countries are going to have this. These are found outside in the city boundaries. Uh, we usually associate them with uh, agricultural regions. Uh, in developing countries, these are you know usually small remote villages, one way in, one way out, and they're usually you know one two story, non engineered, using local uh, materials and construction techniques. So next up, we have the residential development patterns. Uh, these are pretty obvious. They're mainly uh one and two story, single family, detached homes, uh, probably local materials, construction methodologies. Uh, one thing you'll notice here is that, you know, one of these cells is blank. That doesn't necessarily mean there's no residential uh, regions in the, house, in, the, uh, in the area. It's just that there is no construction pattern that met all our uh, requirements for the residential development pattern, residential uh, occupancies probably are going to fit into another uh, development pattern. Uh, next is what we're calling uh, high-density high residential development patterns. And these are typically found in and around the uh, urban uh, centers. And you'll notice things start getting a little more dense, maybe a little taller uh, with each development pattern. Uh, but a majority of the population here you know, lives in multifamily uh, residential housing, apartment structures. Um, still, we're looking at low rise with some occasional mid rise buildings. Uh, next up, we have the urban development patterns. These are exactly as it, how they sound. Uh, they're found in, in and around the major um, city centers. You know, space is limited, so buildings are pretty tight and they're fairly regular in shape just to fit within the block. Um, You'll typically see these as low to mid rise residential. This is where you start seeing a lot of the commercial come in uh, with the occasional high rise, you know, office building or apartment structure. So here we have one step above the urban development pattern. It's what we're calling the high urban. These are found only in the uh, major cities, 
and they're typically the central business district of, uh, of the region. Uh, they're occupied by mid to high rise uh, buildings. You can see from the satellite image, you know, how dense space it is. You can see how tall they are from the shadows and just the angle of this uh, image. Um, there's three lengths here. Again, not every country is going to have it. So this is why we're going to start seeing the uh, phasing out uh, of this development pattern in a lot of the more uh, underdeveloped areas. The last of the uh, typical development patterns are industrial areas. These are pretty obvious uh, from satellite imagery. And they're usually, you know, ports, mining area, other industrial activities, uh, the large warehouses, regular in shape. You can see large rectangular buildings basically in these development patterns. You'll also see some, you know, low rise uh, office and commercial supporting areas, but for the most part, it's going to be uh, uh, warehouse structures. So here are some other special types that we've observed uh, around the world. Uh, they're not going to be everywhere, um, but they will be there in some cases. Uh, the first one are informal housing. These are pretty dense uh, informal settlements. And you'll usually find them around, you know, around the edges of any major city. Uh, they're standalone structures, basically no space in between any of them. Uh, they're almost always unplanned, uh, non-engineer, non and what they'll do is pretty much use any local materials to, to create these areas. Uh, on the other extreme are these local calling very high urban uh, areas. These are you know, global central business dis districts, uh, and those always high-rise buildings. Bottom right is a uh, home call. You just see the high profiles. Are much different sizes are much different than any other other development pattern that we've gone through so far. So now that we know the unique development patterns, we need to be able to associate a uh, a mapping scheme to each of them. So mapping schemes basically give you a breakdown percentage wise of the built up environment. Uh, mapping schemes can include you know story height profiles, uh, structural type profiles, occupancy. Uh, of TIV later on, but basically each development pattern gets this unique distribution for a future analysis. Um, for the mapping scheme basics, we'll go through three things. Uh, first, we'll show how to identify which structural types are in your region. Uh, and then we'll go over how to gather and organize any type of census data that's available. And lastly, how to construct these uh, Mapping schemes, building distributions, et cetera. So the first thing you want to do in your country of interest, region of interest, is know what the built up environment can consist of. You know, what materials are used, what's a typical structural system. Now, things in the US are going to be much different than areas such as uh, Nepal. So the first thing that we'll do is look at any scholarly or online journals. Uh, the World Housing Encyclopedia and APDNA reports. And the good thing about these is they go pretty in depth of what uh, unique buildings are, structural materials, a lot of force resistant systems, uh, the methodologies of construction, uh, the region specific, and you know they'll give you any known structural details, deficiencies, and details uh, for future vulnerability modeling. So next, we look at any type of uh, country-specific assessments. This is usually in the form of um, census data. The census data is good because it gives a general overview of the country, and usually they provide you know breakouts percentages of uh, materials, home materials, uh, wall materials, roofing, flooring, etc. Uh, one of the cons is that you know sometimes it's limited the this information if you can get it. And uh, there's no uh, distribution of, you know, the lateral force resistance system. They'll give you the main materials for things such as the walls, but you're going to have to use the information you gathered from your uh, initial research to essentially uh, assign these main materials to a structural system. When we look a little bit broader, we can use the uh, global building exposure databases, such as this one from Pager. Uh, 
essentially they gave a pretty detailed description of the structural type distribution for all countries in the world. Um, there's a downside too that you know it's limited to essentially rural, uh, urban, and not all countries are country specific, meaning that if they don't have enough data for one country, they'll use a proxy uh, from a neighboring country. So we have to be uh, aware of using this type of data. In regards to documentation, what we'll lastly look at is building codes. Uh, these are good because they're country specific. And so they'll tell you any uh, applicable materials and construction practices that they do use. The cons are, you know, enforcement can and often maybe limited. So what you see in the code might not be what you see out in the field. So you have to be careful with your uh, vulnerability modeling uh, if this is the case. So one of the things we have really rely on for identifying the construction types or any type of ground imagery or videos, uh, mainly Google Street View and Mapillary. Uh, the pros of, pros of this is that, you know, they're widely available and also pretty good quality. Uh, some cases in post event, there'll be some damaged buildings. So you can get uh, images of the building materials, maybe some structural types. Um, another advantage is if you use this in combination with satellite images, you can start making some correlations between, you know, I know it has this type of roof, this type of slope material from the satellite image. I know it's the structural type from the ground view. So now you can start making some assumptions based purely on the satellite images. At that point, uh, the cons that they're often pretty limited in rural and maybe more developed, con under developed con developing countries. Um, this is when you're going to have to start looking at, you know, online photo sites or videos to get uh, any good idea of what the built environment is. So the point of this slide is to show you how to get from, you know, a satellite photo down to a uh, identified structural type. Uh, the top row, we have all our development patterns. On um, the middle row, we have typical buildings that we're seeing in the street view. And then this bottom row is where it's pretty advantageous for the street view, as we'll often see buildings under construction, which reveal the building materials and the uh, structural system uh, within the region, within the development pattern. So if you're not able to find some buildings on your construction with the ground imagery, there's some other you know, tips and tricks that we can do to figure out the structural type or building materials. Uh, this first one, I'll look at all sides. You know, the back side doesn't have the curve appeal that they need, so it's off, off to not finished. So if we go to the back, we can see that, you know, three reinforced masonry building, uh, which you can't really see from the front with the facade. Uh, again, Google, Earth has historic satellite imagery. You can toggle through that and see if you can capture uh, when it was under construction. Here we can see it's tilt up. Uh, Google Street, Google Maps also has a historic ground imagery. Uh, it's pretty recent though, so you're not going to go pretty far back. But here we're able to capture this apartment structure in Florida under construction. Uh, we can see it's a reinforced block, reinforced masonry block wall uh, building because we're able to capture it under construction. So once we have a good handle on the construction types within a given region, we need to start creating these uh, building distribution breakouts uh, for each development pattern. And by breakouts, we mean what's the percent distribution of each structural type, what's the percent distribution of every uh, building height, occupancy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, for rural residential, we typically or heavily rely on any type of census or global data, uh, depending on the resolution. So these are good because, you know, Street View often is pretty limited out there and they will provide percent breakouts by the wall material. Uh, we can't use that wall material for any evolving building modeling. So what we have to do here, uh, as in that bottom table there, is essentially map it uh to something that we can use in this case a uh, pager so using the you know knowledge you have uh building materials uh structural types etc that you learned from the um previous slides 
you're able to map directly the wall type to AJ type for feature analysis. For non rural uh, regions, we look for any uh, country specific exposure studies for uh, mapping scheme development. Uh, these are usually done in high hazard regions. Uh, for example, the one on the left is a GIS in uh, Tunisia. What it essentially was, was a field survey where they recorded the number of stories, structural type, um, age, uh, occupancy. And so if we have that data and we have our development patterns, we can essentially overlay the two and pull uh, mapping schemes directly uh, that way. We, of course, do some sanity checking, <clears throat> again, with the street view, uh, make sure that the, some of the assumptions are, uh, are correct and we'll you know, redistribute the structural types or building heights based on our judgment of what we see uh, on our review. If the relevant census data or the uh, previously done field surveys are not available, we do a stratified sampling ourselves. This is both for the development of the mapping schemes and validation of any uh, serious mapping scheme that we already have. Uh, this can be desktop, which is both probably most of the time, or uh, a ground survey, field survey tone. Uh, so for example, on the left, we have our um, development pattern was, and we want to sample. Uh, we go through, identify each unique building, structural type, their height, et cetera. Uh, we do this a few times throughout the region to make sure we cover uh, you know, variations in the development pattern. From there, we essentially create these distributions that you will see on the right side from our sample. So on the right, we have each unique uh, structural type, we have each development pattern, and on the, the cells are our observations and our distributions of those based on our desktop study. So that was a summary on how we come up with the development patterns and how we create the uh, mapping schemes unique to that development pattern. Uh, just a few things in summary. Um, first, you know, do an online search to identify all the materials, all the structural types that are typical in that region. Uh, once you have those, go through, you know, Google satellite view, ground imagery, make sure you can find those and validate that those assumptions are correct. Uh, you definitely want to make use of any type of census data or region specific or field surveys. Uh, it takes a lot of the legwork out and they can help you with some uh, preliminary uh, mapping schemes. Uh, once you have those mapping schemes, though, you need to be able to validate these, uh, maybe through a stratified sampling. Uh, again, the stratified sampling can be used to create the mapping schemes for those development patterns if we don't have any. Uh, at the end of it, I like to do a quick sanity check. Essentially, do these results make any sense? Uh, on the table on the left is development pattern one, development pattern two, four, five, six. Uh, seven is industrial, but one is rural, two is residential, four is high density residential. Five is urban, six is a uh, high urban. So you want to make, you want to look at it and make sure you know. Do these height profiles make sense? Are there taller buildings where I expect them to be taller buildings, which is in the uh, urban regions? Are the local materials, you know, the wattle and dobs, the adobes, are they mainly in the rural residential regions? And again, on the opposite end for the, you know, the engineering construction, these reinforced concrete frame or steel brace frame. Uh, buildings, are they in a region where I'd expect them to be, which is typically going to be in your, you know, your higher urban uh, developed central business districts. And so with that, I'll leave it and I hope you uh, enjoyed the presentation and learned something from it. Thank you. I'll be presenting with my colleague Z, and we'll be going through this case study, which is a walkthrough of building exposure data from Tunisia. This was a project tasked to us by the World Bank, and essentially they wanted us to perform a multi hazard study for the Republic of Tunisia, looking at both uh, flood and earthquake risks. Our tasks included exposure development and a review of incorporation of format suitable for loss estimation and also data collection. Uh, guidance on vulnerability assessment assignments for both seismic and flood. Uh, assessment of the risk of the built-up environment and a visualization within a BI tool. Uh, 
So the first thing that we did was identify all the homogenous zones or the uh, development patterns, uh, which we talked about previously. This was pretty important for this country since it's kind of a mix between, you know, older, vulnerable uh, buildings and some of the newer developments that you'll see in uh, residential or maybe urban areas. Uh, so we identified five regions, four shown here, uh, rural is not shown, but what we have here is the essentially detached residential uh, development patterns, uh, industrial development patterns occupied by those large warehouses again. Uh, the urban regions, these are typically mid-rise uh, buildings uh, found in the city center. And then on the outskirts, you have these really dense, uh, high density uh, residential uh, structure development patterns, which are occupied by you know, some of these more older, uh, vulnerable uh, structures, which we'll go into later. Once we knew what the development patterns were going to be, uh, we needed to assess the uh, built up environment, essentially asking the question, you know, what type of uh, permitted and also non permitted construction and build building materials are prevalent throughout the country. Uh, we relied heavily mainly on three things. Uh, first was ground imagery. This was pretty limited through uh, Google Earth, but there definitely was some uh, ground imagery we used for validation and assessment. Uh, the census and housing data uh, that we had the Tunisia housing product profile from UN Habitat. Uh, we also looked at Pager for some uh, general uh, building distributions. And finally, we had these uh, country profile studies, uh, which go into pretty good detail regarding the uh, structural types structural distributions for uh, different parts of the region. So we were able to get this national catastrophe risk profile from the World Bank. Uh, this was pretty advantageous in three ways, essentially. First of all, it gave us the structural types that are prevalent within the country. Uh, it was in French, which we translated. Uh, it gave us distributions for the rural and urban areas for residential and non-residential construction. And it also gave us these vulnerability curves seen in the bottom right for each of the uh, structural systems that they identified. So given those different lateral force resisting systems from the national risk profile, uh, we needed to be able to identify them uh, visually for both static check and for validation. So what we did was we used the uh, limited street view imagery and any online photos to essentially identify and label uh, each of those types uh, that you see here. Uh, next, we looked at census data from the World Bank and uh, Ernst & Young. This detailed census data provided the foundation for the mapping schemes of the predominantly uh, residential development patterns, as the data provided a breakout of the different types of housing. From the uh, top left, you can see it's traditional, rudimentary, semi-detached uh, villas or apartments. Uh, structural types for these housing were not uh, provided. Therefore, we had to rely on uh, descriptions laid out in the Tunisia housing profile, which we'll go through uh, after this. But this was beneficial because it gave us breakouts of these housing types for every governor. And so we started looking through all these governorates and some of them were solely residential or solely HD residential. So we could start those using those as the preliminary mapping schemes for some of these uh, basic development patterns. So the World Bank and Ernst & Young census data, data gave us uh, five different housing types that are found within each governorate. governorate. Uh, the problem is we didn't know uh, where they were, what they looked like, what kind of structure type it was. Thankfully, we found this uh, Tunisia housing pile from the UN Habitat. And in it, they go through each of the five different types, and they even have a satellite photo of what these typical types look like. So what we're able to do is find these uh, types in satellite imagery, Google Earth, use street view imagery to assign a structural type to it. And given those structural types, we assign them back to the World Bank distributions. And so from there, we can create these uh, residential development pattern mapping schemes. So this was predominantly used just for those uh, residential development patterns. Uh, 
Another source relied on was a study from the University of Tunis. Uh, and essentially what they did was they inventoried uh, certain blocks uh, within the city of Tunis and had an assessment of their vulnerability. Uh, you can see on the top which buildings were surveyed and they this ground survey it recorded quite a few things, which was the you know the structural type, the occupancy, uh, where it was built, the number of stories. And we use this for the uh, non-residential uh, statistics since we already had a lot of residential st stats for uh, from census data. Uh, this is great. It was direct observation and a breakdown of uh, structural types for this downtown urban region. And this was suitable for our uh, urban development patterns. So where we didn't have any census data or field survey data from uh, previous studies, um, we needed to do uh, essentially a, a stratified sampling strategy uh, to come up with these mapping schemes. This was mainly what well, is only done for the uh, uh, industrial development patterns. Uh, although, you know, it's the Ernst & Young and World Bank uh, data provide a number of lots and lot sizes. Uh, there is no information regarding the structural type. So what we had to do was survey this, these regions uh, throughout the country. And we recorded both the uh, number of stories and the associated structural type using the information that we already had from the, uh, uh, the previous studies. So we ended up coming up with this distribution for uh, industrial development patterns seen on the top right. So we used all the census data, field survey data, uh, ground imagery to essentially come up with this uh, nationwide mapping scheme for Tunisia for each of these five uh, development patterns, res rural, residential, HT residential, urban, and industrial. Uh, to recap, for the rural, residential, and HT residential, we relied heavily on the, uh, the World Bank and Ernst Young census data. These gave us the distributions by government. The Tunisia housing data allowed us to relate those housing types to the Ernst & Young uh, building types. Uh, for the urban, we relied on the um, um, field survey from the University of Tunis. Uh, we did validation uh, inspection uh, on our own to essentially sanity check any of those results. And for the industrial, again, it was a sampling strategy. There was no information regarding structural types for this from anything that we could find. Uh, we needed to make sure these were all consistent. So we used the um, uh, structural types seen below in French, apologies. Uh, but anything that we got from the Ernst & Young or the University of Tunis or from our sampling, we had to essentially map to one of these structural types. So that's all consistent across the board. Um, so we ended up with this uh, mapping scheme seen below. And my colleague Z uh, will go ahead and uh, essentially tell us how we used all this information. So once the development patterns were ready, so we used a machine learning model to classify development patterns across the entire country. So we took those digitized regions and we used that for training to create that model. And we did that in Google's engine platform. We chose that because uh, first it had a lot of different data sets. We have, we're using Landsat, we use peers. We also use classified layers. Uh, one layer we used was global uh, human sediment layer. So all those data were easily available within the platform. And also second, it's very easy to pre-process that data. So we have, we're stacking all that data. We had to resample some of the data for because of different resolutions. We're stacking that with the some normalization. So all of that was very uh, easily done. Then they have built-in uh, learning models. They have some uh, different type of algorithm that we could test out to generate the final model. We could generate, uh, we could do the testing of the, the performance of the model within that platform. And once we did that, uh, the final Classified uh, grids were exported into a TIFF that we use for the next step of processing. And the TIFF that we created was at 15 uh, arc seconds, which is close to half a kilometer resolution. So here we see the classifier layer overlay on the city of Tunis. And here we see uh, the different colors represented the different development patterns. 
The yellow color represents uh, the urban development pattern. We can see that in the city center. Then across that, we see a lot of these more cyan, bluish color dots, the residential. Then we have this little purple. Uh, those are the dense residential. So we see these uh, zones to be classified. And out of the city, we see the rural pattern, which more the, the brownish color. Here we see an, an example for another city where we have a lot less of the urban development pattern, but a lot more of the residential and dense residential. So with the grids classified, uh, we did the exposure disaggregation. Here by disaggregation, we mean to geographically distribute the exposure onto these grids. Okay. And the data that we got from Ernst Young, the expo original exposure data, those were aggregated at the admin level. So here we use the remote sensing signal that for each of these classified grids, and we distributed that geographically proportionally. And then we also value the proportion depending on the different development patterns. Because a different different pattern, the total amount is quite different. The in the in the replacement value for those amount were also different. And then we apply these mapping schemes to represent the uh, vulnerability. So at the end of that, we have the different grids. For each grid, we have the total amount of exposure represented, like number of buildings. So we had the total replacement costs and a series of vulnerability and the proportion of vulnerability that characterizes that exposure for every grid. So we did that analysis for the general residential, commercial, industrial. We also did that for some quite specific one for education, financial, health, tourism. And for some special types, this method we did not apply. Uh, for the point specific ones, by poor dams, these are the disaggregation, uh, the disaggregation method does not apply. And also for some other one, which did not have damage functions. We also did the exposure refinement for some areas. And so this is to better characterize the flooding. So the original grid, remember, it was close to a half kilometer which is adequate for earthquake analysis, but this is too coarse for flood modeling, especially because we had a, a flood data at much higher resolution. So if you can see from, from this picture, if the red color represents the area of a grid, the flood region is actually smaller than that. But if we're using this entire grid as a representative exposure, all we can do is just say the entire region is being flooded, which is, not correct. Then also, it's not really correct to assume that exposure is evenly distributed within that grid. So we use higher resolution remote sensing, and we did a higher level of disaggregation that gave us a better grid resolution around the rivers, near river area or area that uh, represented in those flooded areas. So we have better representation of the exposure at 90 meters. So we can have a better understanding of the flood risk. Now let's talk about the hazard data used. Uh, for flood, we use fluvial defended, fluvial undefended. Uh, both of these are from uh, inundation caused by rivers. And defended, undefended, the defense is the presence of uh, defenses along the river, like flood walls or barriers. Fluvial, uh, fluvial data, those are inundation zones caused by excessive rain. So we had data at 90 meters. That's where we did the uh, disaggregation refinement. We had the refinement for 90 meters. And we had flood depth for 10 different repair periods. And so each of these repair period could be converted into a probability that helped us in the end to calculate the annualized average loss. So for earthquake, uh, we had a data which a lot more coarse, as you can see from that, but we had it for the entire country. And uh, the metric that we used was peak ground acceleration. And we had that for seven different return periods. The next step is to calculate the loss using the return period hazard values at every grid and the exposure with the vulnerabilities. We're able to calculate the losses so in the end, we kind of have a return period loss curve for every grid, for every occupancy. 
So we collapse that return period curve into an annualized average loss. Remember, uh, the return periods correspond to different probabilities. So that can be aggregated into an AAL for every grid. The AAL was also aggregated for each admin one unit. So the final step was loading all that loss information, the exposure information into a BI tool. And that was uh, the, the final presentation of the result. And the BI tool was very useful because it was presenting a map. It had different uh, charts and different ways of representing the data. And the best part is these are interactive. So people click on uh, area that admin, the graphs gets updated with the, with the value from that admin. Or if they want to see a particular uh, occupancy, they can just click on the occupancy and see all the results being updated. So this concludes our uh, use case for what we did for Tunisia. Charlie, Georgiana, Mike, thank you all for your terrific presentations. So let's review what we covered here today. We discussed exposure data and how it's used in the loss estimation process, as well as a basic process of developing those data. Additionally, we covered structural map mapping scheme development, and building sampling and ended with a case study involving building exposure data in Tunisia. On October 5th, in part two, two days from now, we'll continue with the discussion with the development of site-specific exposure data with Earth, Earth observations. We'll also be looking at developing building structure data sets and a case study used to characterize vulnerabilities. So we hope that you can all join us for part two. Below is the contact information for Charlie, Georgiana, and Mike, along with links to the training webpage, social media. And if you enjoyed today's webinar, we hope you'll sign up for our SETS web listserv to receive not notifications of future trainings. And follow us on various social media platforms for other relevant announcements pertaining to NASA's Earth Sciences. We'll now transition to the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Thank you. All right, welcome to the question and answer session. Thank you everybody for submitting your questions throughout the presentation. And we've been working as a team to address those. And what I'll do is I'll just dive right in. And for any of the trainers um, that provided the answers, please feel free at any time to <clears throat> unmute and uh, go through the document with me. So uh, I'll start with question one. How is it cost effective to actually retrofit when you have to spend the extra time and money on customizing specific requirements? I'm sorry, Brock, am I supposed to uh, uh, jump in here and answer the question? I thought you were gonna read there for a second. Uh, well, I, I thought it might be be best who um, who actually provided the the text here to kind of walk through it, and I'll capture anything else that you might add to the answer. Okay, um, Mike, why don't you go ahead and start, and then I'll um, I'll follow up the back. Thank you, Mike. Uh, sure. Yeah. So, how do we know if it's cost effective? Basically, you will do a benefit cost analysis uh, just to see if this retrofit is uh, cost effective. So what we do is, you know, we run through the analysis, we calculate the expected losses for the as-is building, meaning the non-retrofitted building. We'll go ahead, this is expected losses in regards to loss of life, injury, things like that. And then we'll do the same analysis for the building that is retrofitted. And when you, when it is cost-effective, uh, your BCR, your benefit-cost ratio, uh, will be essentially above one. So I put an example, you know, if your seismic retrofit cost 10K and through our analysis, we expect 20K in savings, that's a DCR of two. We expect that to be a cost beneficial, cost beneficial at that point. Yeah, and I think that um, uh, kind of embedded in the question is, how can it really be a cost effective if you have to do a lot of uh, custom work? It's a, um, it's kind of a, a, a 
we don't just look at retrofits and that um, um, analysis. We look at um, the cost effectiveness of new building codes, uh, the cost effectiveness of buyouts, actually removing uh, homes from areas of high risk. Um, but we also do sometimes look at um, specific types of retrofit, many of which, you know, uh, will require um, 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 adaptation for specific buildings like uh, trailer tie downs or uh, retrofitting for earthquakes, but are, are, are fairly standard. So the customization does not add a lot of cost to the project. And then in some projects, they're, they'll be highly customized. And in those cases, those are usually uh, uh, cost effective in areas of high risk where you have life safety concerns or a lot of um, um, you know, benefit costs. I'm sorry, um, business interruption concerns. So those are uh, also included in the benefits of the um, of the BCA analysis that Mike was talking about. Thank you very much, Mike and Charlie. And uh, for all the participants, uh, please feel free to continue adding questions to the question answer box, and we'll add this them to this document, and we'll try to address as many as we can during our Q and A session. Uh, so please keep them coming. Question two. What would be the possibility of exposure mapping in terms of accuracy of renewable energy to asset extreme events using EO data? Yeah, so this um, it's uh, difficult to answer that, that question without knowing sort of the specifics of the application. But this is definitely, you know, uh, exposure data is definitely being used to, uh, uh, you know, assess uh, tran transition risk. One thing that uh, you know we've been involved with is looking at the vulnerability of uh, new sites, placement of, of, of new sites, or um, the uh, the risk associated with solar panels. Uh, accuracy is really going to depend on the specific application. Great, thank you. Question three: Can you provide some articles related to how the me how to measure building height and shade patterns in urban areas? Yeah, it looks like the uh, the questioner is looking at trying to characterize uh, um, heat islands. Uh, I've not done any work in the um, shade patterns um, myself. Uh, and in terms of uh, uh, measuring building height, it really depends on your base data uh, and your application. I just would recommend going to uh, Google Scholar. That's often what we do to start. Thank you. Question four, on slide nine, SAR was mentioned, synthetic aperture radar, when talking about building height. Sentinel-1 data has a ground resolution of 10 meters. What would be the vertical accuracy when using this data set for estimating the building height? Presuming, picked up correctly, that Sentinel-1 SAR was used to find that building height. So this is a highly technical question that I don't know the answer to. Um, uh, Sentinel-1 was not used on that slide. That um, slide was actually just an illustration of the types of things that you can use EO for. Um, that specific study was uh, uh, from uh, quite a while ago and actually used airborne SAR data. I think that uh, the resolution was about three meters. Uh, I looked into the accuracy of that data set for quite a while, actually, um, as a um, uh, you know, a, a study, and you know, we discovered that uh, you know specific buildings might actually disappear uh, in the SAR data, depending on the orientation of the building, what was on the roof, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. So we got unprocessed SAR data and looked into the accuracy ourselves. So there's there's definitely uh, issues with trying to get uh, heights from specific buildings from SAR data. That's not the way that we actually use the data typically. We will use it to come up with uh, almost like a height profile. Or region, uh, which would be used basically to uh, uh, extrapolate um, um, structural characteristics in the and the, the methods that uh, um, using the methods of developing uh, building patterns, development patterns um, that some of the other speakers addressed. So, uh, yes, our data for heights can be highly problematic. Great, thank you very much for that clarification. Question five. In the step of estimating the distribution of building by development patterns, identifying delineating development patterns, how much effort goes into this process and can it be automated? Second question to that is, is there a global data set that has this information or does it need to be calculated for each study area? So, um, you know, it's um, 
A lot of these, uh, the answers to these questions will depend on the scale of the work that's being done. Um, we almost never use uh, automated um, um, detection algorithms. We almost always do semi-automated uh, detection algorithms that will start with a long conversation with uh, Mike and uh, um, Z and Georgiana and myself, uh, looking at the specific um, structural uh, um, characteristics of the uh, country and um, and the risks of the country and what we think that can be extracted. So you almost want to start with um, some some base knowledge to to make sure that you don't miss anything in an automated process. Um, uh, is there uh, is there global data sets that, that, that you can use? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's the uh, World Housing Encyclopedia from um, ERI. Um, that's a great source for structural information. I believe Mike mentioned that. Um, GEM has uh, a global data set where they've got um, uh, structural types. Uh, I don't think they have development patterns, but they have structural types. Um, Pager has embedded um, structural types um, by urban and non-urban areas that can be used uh, in conjunction with development patterns. And then the Meteor Project by BGS that's mentioned here uh, has uh, 46 countries, developing countries, uh, where we've provided that information. Great, thank you. Question six. I live in Qatar, which is on the coast of the Arabian Gulf. Our region is generally extremely low risk in terms of natural disasters and thus we have tons of energy producing plants to the sea even though it's considered safe we still need to take measures in the case of that one percent what approach would be appropriate to address the what ifs sorry i, I can take this one again um, yes, yeah, so uh, if you're looking specifically at the risk to the power plants and energy generation facilities, uh, you, the first thing to do is to start with the locations of those plants and then overlay uh, your risk data. If you've got flood data, you, know, you mentioned 1%, uh, getting a 1% flood hazard data set, there's international data sets that you can uh, um, start with that are um, commercial. Fathom, for example, is a good source, JBA. Um, uh, and then overlay with the facility location and then use that to prioritize um, the acquisition of more uh, uh, high resolution data. If you're looking at very high um, uh, value facilities such as this, though, you might not want to uh, uh, rely on 1%. You might look at the 500 year, the 2500 year uh, flood maps because um, for one thing, climate is changing and it pays to be conservative. And, and on the other hand, it might be very cost effective to um, uh, uh, mitigate those uh, high value properties um, that you know, can have massive cascading, particularly if you're talking about you know, an energy generation, an um, energy generating economy there, um, that can be very disruptive to um, probably the uh, economy of Qatar. So you might wanna look beyond the 1%. Great, thank you. Question seven. It's nice to learn about ongoing projects in Nepal for identifying building heights. The country has scattered buildings in hills and mountains. How can I estimate the number of buildings in such terrains with scattered built-up patterns? Further, for the use of local resources like slates, rock, or wooden or bushy rooftops make it even more challenging to detect buildings. Have you seen any um, similar work in this area? Yeah, I mean, we've done a lot of work in Nepal. Uh, it's hard. Uh, and specifically, we use um, the mountainous areas in Nepal as an illustrative example of how hard it can be. Uh, um, that being said, you know, we've done the best we can. We've developed uh, both a level one and a level three data set for Nepal in order to kind of compare the two. Uh, also on a project with uh, um, GS from the Coast Space Agency and OSM was on that project. Um, you know, if you're if you're trying to um, um, get specific buildings, you can't beat the human eye uh, and, and, and high resolution data. And that's actually what was done by OSM. Given the um, a magnitude of the risk in Nepal, I think they've got had their kind of crowdsourcing engine um, digitize uh, every building footprint. And that's a very good guess. And you can cross reference that with uh, uh, population data sets and scale up if you need to, but I don't really need, I don't think you need to um, um, 
skill too much, um, maybe in some of those um, those uh, mountainous areas. So anyway, there are sources, uh, the Meteor Project, um, maybe one of my cohorts here can get the link and, and put it in there that you can, um, you can uh, um, take a look at. Great, thank you. And uh, it's nice to have a clarification that no, it, it, it can be uh, a little bit difficult, and um, but there are some ways being developed to work around those. Question eight, when estimating raster cell population counts using building and other spatial data sets, have you come across known under forest canopy populations that are undetectable by remote sensing? If so, how did you account for those counts? Yeah, so I mean, uh, this is a um, this is another limitation that we really want to be upfront with, um, and uh, everybody on the call needs to be upfront with if you uh, go down the road of developing these exposure data sets. And that is, you know, um, you can't characterize what you can't see there. You, you know, if you if you do characterize it, you have to be very transparent in how you go about that process, uh, and um, and that needs to be uh, uh, you know a limitation. If if you, for example, have uh, an area where you've got severe flood risk under a tree can canopy, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to make very definitive statements about that risk. And that, that's something that, that you need to understand. I think we've got a whole session on that, actually, some of the limitations that's, uh, that you need to look at. Um, so, uh, and a good example is the pop grid data, right? Pop grid is an effort led by um, CSIN where they've uh, actually mapped different um, global population data sets in the same um, screen so that users can see how different um, um, isometrically mapped assumptions about distribution of population can result in very different uh, um, estimates on, uh, on a per grid basis. So anyway, I mean, the question is sort of what have we done um, in those uh, situations? I think, you know, um, Papua New Guinea was a, a good example for us where there was, we had to kind of uh, throw up our hands and um, uh, uh, rely on some um, uh, more statistical methods. And in those cases, uh, we we acquired uh, uh, language spoken maps of, uh, of tribes that could be very small and used that to distribute the population. We were able to find clearings on coastal areas associated with uh, farming and development. We placed a lot of population in those areas. Uh, and then I think that there was in some areas that were internal to the country, um, we just uh, made some assumptions about from distance from roads. But it can be very difficult, and that's one of the areas um, that you need to be very transparent about. Great, that's uh, good to know. And um, you know, uh, we've we're trying to create a nice community based around these trainings and people working in these areas. Uh, so. Hopefully, we can communicate these approaches and successes and limitations um, uh, throughout and overcome them together. Question nine. <clears throat> On the slide mapping scheme basics, a lot of different sources are mentioned. How much of this data is processed automatically and how much is done manually? I want to get an idea how long it would take to create a view of building composition in a middle-sized town in an agricultural fo focus semi-rural region, in other words, not highly developed. Okay, I spent a lot of time answering these questions, so, uh, uh, but I think uh, any of my colleagues can jump in any time and, and give, me, uh, uh, give me a hand here. Um, uh, really, um, how much money is spent developing the exposure um, database depends on many, many factors, including uh, the risk of the town, uh, the risk of the area. Um, uh, so that is, uh, you know, how much do you have to actually get this, uh, get it down? If it's in a not a very risky area, you know, you might be able to get a um, get away with not doing any development patterns and going to something like a hazardous database or or some um, um, global data set to look at the risk. If it's a very high risk town and you're worried about schools and hospitals, it can be a very extensive effort. Um, but I think uh, if we're specifically talking about the um, mapping scheme development pattern work, um, you know, um, going to um, get local land use planning maps is a, a great place to start. If you've got tax assessor data, you can um, you can manipulate that um, um, to actually go beyond the need for um, getting some of these development patterns. But you know, um, you, you know, 
putting these things together in a few days to a week um, is, is very reasonable. Um, you know, there's a lot that you can infer from looking at um, high resolution optical data in Google Earth. Yeah, I'll just add that, you know, it really depends on the extent of the study. You know, if you're looking at the entire country, you're not worried about every single structural type within that country. But if we're looking at a, you know, a small town, I, the variations in the structural types and next building heights, will be pretty uh, homogenous at that point. So, you, you know, you're, you're limited in what you need to look at. So your level of effort is much smaller. Great, thank you, Mike. And uh, question 10, are we, gonna, are we going to get the case study PDF? Now, when I saw this come through, I thought possibly at first they were referring to uh, the PDF of the presentation here today, um, but it is also possible that they could be referring to uh, a, a specific case study and uh, a link to that. Um, so the person who asked that question, if you could drop in the question box uh, a little bit of clarification, and if so, maybe we can find that URL for you. Question 11, uh, is Google Earth engine source code available? Is it possible to analyze your own satellite data in Google Earth engine? Or can you only use data available in their catalogs? Do you want to take this one? Uh, yeah, I say the source code. It's, it's for well, the data that the source code that we use in Google. It, it's it's uh, it's there. Uh, you you can upload own data into Google Earth Engine. You can use that to to process. But you have to check. Uh, you might want to check the licensing if you want to do any kind of commercial satellite data. If you want to put it in Google. That you you definitely need, want, would like to check that and, and make sure that it's within. Uh, your your permitted use and and see also what Google does once the data gets into there. So yeah, but that that's the short. But Google Earth, uh, it's what we use. It's very very uh, basic in terms of what 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 the engine provides in terms of uh, being able to process that data. But yeah, if anybody uh, requires some kind of sample, we can look into see what parts that's not proprietary. We can we can distribute. Yeah, thank you. And um, you know, we had contact information in uh, the contact slide at the end of the presentation. So, um, question twelve: Independent from population density, where we already have different global raster data sets, or POP land scan, for example, is there any GIS global later in indicating settlement vulnerability considering the urban structures? And I'll try to capture what you say here. Uh, Mike, you wanna um, you wanna give this one a shot? You may be muted, or we we, we could also uh, move on to. Um, Question 13. I give, I give it a shot. I, I don't think that there's any GIS data sets that um, uh, capture that data. Um, we've already mentioned several uh, others that might be useful here. Um, there's the World Housing Encyclopedia. We have USGS has things by urban and non urban areas. Um, there's are many places there. And then uh, the GEM database. Um, I'm not sure how public that is, but uh, it's definitely a good place to have a look. It's GEM. Yeah. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, concerning urban structures, I mean, Pager, the Pager database has a, a tab specifically for uh, urban structural types. So uh, just be careful that a lot of these are using proxy cases. So you want to make sure that what you're looking at is, is uh, essentially usable at that point. Great, thank you. Uh, and this next one focuses on um, the case study. Um, so uh, possibly Z or Mike be able to uh, address this one. What is the success rate of the Tunisia case study and the limitations? Maybe we need a little clarification on the success yeah. rate, but maybe you can comment to that. 
yeah, that, I think that's uh, we're uh, not sure what the success rate it's, it's trying to uh, ask. Maybe we can could get a clarifying question on that. But for the Tunisia case study, uh, like mentioned, where the goal was to have a view uh, of the hazard for the entire not hazard for the the rest of the entire country for a flood and earthquake. So for for that purpose, we knew entering what the limitation of the the analysis could be because depending on uh, based on the the data that was used so we could not do uh i mean pmls we cannot do a return period assessment of the risk we could only use the data that existed uh the, the sources of hazard and and that existed to do the risk analysis so in terms of the the exposure we have some base exposure data that we used and we used our, our the methodology that we described to uh, geo, geospatially locate and say what the vulnerability is at different parts. So in, in that regard, we had a successful uh, successful study, which we were able to produce the results that the World Bank was able to to use. So that that's the uh, if that's the the metric that we use in terms of for the success rate. Great. Ultimately, uh, ultimately, what uh, the country of Tunisia used the data for in terms of their decision making, uh, in terms of uh, acquiring insurance and so forth, which is the ultimate success rate, uh, we were not uh, uh, involved in those conversations. And it can be a frustrating thing uh, often to not have a, a access to your, uh, your game client when you're doing these risk studies, but that's just the, um, that's just the nature of, uh, of the business, I think. Great, thank you very much. Question 14, how can we consider the uncertainty in assessing exposure and vulnerability? And that's kind of a broad question here, but maybe just a, a little bit comment on uncertainty in general when it comes to these terms. I think assessing um, the uh, uncertainty of vulnerability is outside the context of what we're discussing here. There's a whole kind of science behind that. And I believe we do have another session where we talk explicitly about uncertainty uh, and exposure, don't we, guys? In part three, we'll be talking more about that. Yeah, so there'll be a whole session on that in part three. Yeah, but, but in terms of assessing exposure, there are many different aspects of that, which we'll be covering more. Great even more reason to tune in for part three a week from today. Um, question five, uh, Morocco experienced an earthquake. How can I calculate damages post earthquake? Any suggestions about the data sources and tools? And uh, I'm not sure when this question came in, but I, I think that you did cover quite a bit uh, throughout the presentation. So it's possible that you, you did go through some of these um, throughout the rest of the presentation. But if there's anything else that you wanted to comment on here, I can try to capture that. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about I mean, uh, which, which yeah, I'll comment a little bit. I, I'll probably comment a bit. Uh, for earthquake, so for calculating the damages, you definitely need three different parts. One, it's the, the exposure, as we discussed in this in this particular workshop. We were focusing on saying the exposure. That means where where uh, where people buildings are located, what kind of vulnerability they have. Then you have to have the second part, which given the vulnerability, what are the, the damage functions, right? What, what kind of damage would it suffer when you're subject to the hazard? And the last part, of course, is more importantly, where it's the hazard map. So for all three of components, you will need to have uh, information on. So, so today's uh, workshop focused more on the first part, which is creating that building exposure data then you have to have some some engineering uh, expertise to be able to determine what the damages are and and last it's the hazard inform oh, the hazard information that uh, USGS does provide these type of information USGS has a um, has a shake map program which produces ground shaking levels 
uh, ground shaking hazard GIS data that can be downloaded publicly accessible. But depending what region of the world it is, the, the sometimes the accuracy you have to have uh, it needs to be reviewed. So so that's one source that that you can use. Uh, maybe if in in terms of uh, analytics tools. Uh, there, there may be some some ad analytics to already exist. Uh, uh, Gem Global Earthquake Model they do have uh, they do have tools that can be used for earth specific for earthquake damage analysis. So that that may be a source to look into. So USGS for hazard and and Gen can be used for uh, looking into the the calculation. I think it's called Open Quake. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you very much. Question 16, how do you deal with mixed forms of building structures? When I was in North Africa, there was a lot of mixed buildings. Any comments on dealing with that? Uh, I think I'll take a shot at that. Uh, mixed buildings, I'm not, I'm not sure what, the, uh, what they mean here, but if they're talking in regards to mixed structural types, if that's what it is, uh, we typically try to find a vulnerability curve that's specific to that. For example, if it's mixed, you know, reinforced concrete with a QRM infill, we'll have a agility curve uh, specifically for that. If it's talking, if he's talking, he or she is talking in regards to mixed uh, two separate structural systems, we will take the uh, primary one as the uh, primary auto force resistance system as the one we model for our mapping scheme. Hopefully that's what he means by mix. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I think that's also where we we create these uh, development patterns where within a pattern you have different type of buildings all within the mixture and we use the different statistics to determine what distribution of each of these types are within these patterns. Great, thank you very much. On question, question 17, and we have uh, room for a couple more um, before the top of the hour. Does hyperspectral satellite data analysis make analysis better than using broader spectral images? Uh, well, we've got a lot of research into hyperspectral data. We've some some with plume modeling. It's uh, something that I think would be uh, very interesting um, uh, for research. It couldn't hurt. So, in terms of uh, other uh, companies doing this type of work, uh, USGS, FEMA, uh, NIBS. Uh, uh, we're doing this work from a federal perspective. I think it's it's widely recognized it's going to be much more important with climate change. And then there's uh, commercial companies, uh, ImageCAD, AIR, um, RMS, and Moody's, um, CoreLogic. Lots of uh, lots of options here. So we can we can fill in this this question. Some, uh, okay. Great, thank you. Um, I live in the U.S. and I'm interested in doing this kind of work. What companies and organizations are doing this type of work? Or maybe you're already answering that question. Yeah, I was trying to answer yes, that. Yeah, question. yeah, okay. Uh, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll turn around and get to this. And um, what we'll do is once we clean this up and make sure everything is accurate, we'll post this on the training webpage um, for you to download. And you can have URLs uh, there as well, possibly. And let's see here. Um, just briefly, did you go on the ground in Tunisia at any point during the study, or was it completely remotely assessed? Uh, it was completely remote. Um, on the ground, in a sense that we used the available Google Street View and Mapillary uh, ground imagery, but we relied heavily on that and the field survey study from the University of Tunis, essentially. Right, Mike, you. you want to speak more generally about the difference between a study like uh, Tunisia, where we're depending on remote data, and something like you know Costa Rica, where we went in the field? 
Uh, say that again, Charlie. You want to uh, kind of compare and contrast the, the benefits of going out in the field, like maybe looking at Costa Rica as compared to Tunisia? Uh, yeah, you know, Tunisia, we, you know, we were kind of hindered by the uh, vulnerability curves that were available. So, you know, we had all these different structural types and we had to match um, any field survey to those structural types and so we needed to use those vulnerability curves as opposed to going out on our own. You know, we, we can record what we want, what we want to use for our vulnerability curves. Um, you know, if we're looking at things like hurricane, we can start looking at any of these, you know, roof types, hurricane shops, et cetera. Um, but if we're more free to gather the information that we specifically want, as opposed to relying on information that's kind of handed to us. So it kind of goes into where the, uh, into the vulnerability building model quite a bit. Great, thank you. And I see we're at the top of the hour. So um, thank you very much, um, Charlie, Georgiana, Mike, and Z. Uh, we really appreciate your time in this part one of the webinar series. We hope that you all join us for part two this Thursday and then for part three uh, next week. So um, thank you very much for joining us. We're gonna close this for today. We'll post this recording, um, hopefully within 24 hours, if you want to go back and review anything, and we'll include this Q&A in the end of that video as well, and we'll post it on the training webpage. So I hope everybody else has a uh, nice rest of your day, and thank you very much.